Hello, everyone, and welcome to this lecture podcast in week seven on the topic of the law of use of force. This particular topic of public international law remains relevant because even today, uh, states continue to use force against each other, particularly through wars that continue to go on. The, the most recent ones are, of course, the ones which continue to unfold in the case of Syria, where Russia, the United States, Australia, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey are key players in the war going on in, in Syria. There's also the, uh, the, the aspect of the aggression of uh, Russia in Crimea in the Ukraine only last year. And so it would appear that you know, states continue to use armed force against other states and uh, in violation of international law. And we recall that uh, during World War II, because of uh, the devastation of um, wrought by World War II, leading to the deaths of millions of soldiers and millions of innocent civilians, particularly because of the genocide committed by Nazi Germany, the United Nations chart, the United Nations was born, uh, particularly with the hope that uh, international peace will be restored and that it will be preserved. And yet, we also know that notwithstanding the creation and the organization of the United Nations uh, in New York in 1945, uh, wars continued to persist. Uh, among them, the Vietnam War in the uh, in starting in 1965, and even the Korean War during the same period. And uh, armed conflict and the use of force continued to happen, especially in the 1980s uh, in South America, with uh, you know armed groups being sponsored, for example, by the United States to try to topple uh, existing governments, such as the Sandinista government in Nicaragua, and uh, in other parts of, um, of South America. And for its part, uh, the, United, uh, the Union Soviet of Socialist Republic, formerly the, the mother state uh, of Russia, was also uh, responsible for trying to install uh, what might be considered by some to be puppet, puppet states or puppet governments, again, through the use of, of force. And so uh, it is important for us to continue to examine the, the law of use of force in public international law. And this is a lecture podcast uh, that, is, that is brought to you by your unit coordinator, Dr. Manjo Oysen, for week seven of public international and human rights law. So after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the rules of international law on the use of force. And you should also be able to discuss the relationship of the law of use of force with international criminal law. So where, at what point, does the law of use of force and international criminal law overlap? And at which point do they di diverge? Because obviously, uh, international criminal law is often tied with uh, the commission of crimes, especially when you consider that uh, it is a violation of international criminal law for a state to undertake wars of aggression against another state. And you can also have the perpetration of um, war crimes. But at least in relation to wars of aggression, which, com which constitute violations of international criminal law, you also therefore notice that wars of aggression typically use force. Uh, you know, it involves one state using force uh, against another state. And so we take that up as well when we examine the topic on the law of use of force. Uh, I need to uh, explain that my that again uh, I still have a problem with Zoom, and I am unable therefore to to turn on my video, and hopefully um, you know you will understand how it is. Okay, so let's begin with the uh, with the basic postulate and principle in international law about the use of force. So under Article Two, Paragraph Four of the United Nations Charter, it provides that all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. So we, we see that under Article 2 of the United Nations Charter, 
the language is uh, obligatory. It is prescriptive in the sense that it requires all members to refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force. So the mere threat of force is already a violation of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter, and especially the use of force. And we will examine later on uh, the issue of uh, the right to self-defense because the, the basic question that we need to consider as well as we talk about the law of use of force is whether or not a state uh, can undertake preemptive measures as an act of self-defense to defend itself against uh, another state. And secondly, whether if a, you know, if another state uses force against, another, if one state uses force against another state, can that other state against whom the use of force was used uh, rely on the principle of self-defense in order to retaliate against uh, the first state that used force. So uh, we, we will examine that issue in a short while. What we also need to realize is that the principle against uh, the use of threats or the use of force is in fact not only a principle of uh, conventional law, meaning under the UN Charter, but it is a norm of customary international law. In fact, it is a peremptory norm of international law which states are obligated not to depart from. So because the, the, uh, the use of force is so uh, crucial uh, to, to world peace, it is a, an obligation on, on all states to avoid or refrain from using it. And it is impermissible for states, therefore, to, uh, to enter into uh, you know, treaties that would allow them to avoid uh, a, a legal obligation under international law not to use force. So, uh, so even if a member state, uh, even if a state may not therefore be a party to the uh, United Nations, because we know that there are certain states which are not party to the United Nations, such as, uh, for example, Palestine or, or Taiwan, it doesn't mean that um, you know, a state that is not party to the United Nations no longer has an obligation under international law not to use force because um, the, the prescription or the obligation under Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter is simply a codification of a, a customary norm of international law, the peremptory norm of international law. Now, we need to contrast uh, Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter with Article 10 of the 1919 Covenant of the League of Nations. So we will recall, going back to our history, that prior to the uh, creation of the organization of the United Nations Charter, there used to be a League of Nations. Uh, especially after the the, the development of, the, of of World War One, and because again of the deaths of millions of soldiers in the battlefield, as well as civilians who suffered as a result of displacement and famine, and you know even the the murder as a result of uh, World War One, it had been thought by the states at the time that you know another world war would not happen. And so they created the, the League of Nations. And uh, under the League of Nations uh, Covenant in 1919, under Article 10, it provided that the members of the League undertake to respect and preserve, as against external aggression, the territorial integrity and existing political independence of all members of the League. So you will again notice that uh, under the 1919 Covenant of the League of Nations, there is no requirement that uh, members shall not use force. So the language, therefore, under the UN Charter was more explicit uh, and became obligatory in the sense that uh, the use of force is impermissible under international law today. And we also know that the League of Nations eventually was disbanded, mainly because it was unable to stop uh, Nazi Germany from uh, from being responsible for the start of World War II, and it was unable to prevent uh, Nazi Germany from invading uh, many countries in, in Europe uh, during World War II.
So one of the basic questions we ask in relation to the prohibition of the use and threat of force is whether or not um, economic force is also, uh, the use of economic force is also prohibited under the U UN Charter. So for example, uh, what, what if a state, which could be China, which could be the United States, threatens to impose uh, you know, economic sanctions or to use economic force against another state if that particular state uh, fails to, to undertake measures, for example, to stop money laundering or to, uh, to try to uh, reduce the traffic of drugs or to, provide, or to prevent the, the rise of uh, local terrorists in, in their states. Would the threat of the use of economic force be a violation of international law or particularly Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter? And the answer is no, because if you examine Articles 41 and 46 of the United Nations Charter, it particularly talks about armed force. So in Article 41, for example, it states that the UN Security Council may decide what measures not involving the use of armed force are to be employed to give effect to its decisions. And under Article 46, it also provides that uh, plans for the application of armed force shall be made by the Security Council. We also need to remember that at the time that the United Nations was created, uh, because we didn't have globalization then, and uh, there was a very little uh, economic integration among states, uh, we, we, we did not have a situation that we do today when you can have a state that uh, has so, so much uh, economic power that it is in a position to actually actual use economic force against another state. So therefore, at the start of um, at the creation of the United Nations, the idea of an economic force uh, being used by states was not really well known. In fact, it wasn't, it wasn't known then. And so therefore, uh, it wasn't part of the conception of the founders of the United Nations that uh, the use of economic force by one state against another state would be in violation of um, the United Nations Charter. So, it is therefore generally accepted that when we speak of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter, what is prohibited by the United Nations Charter is only the threat or use of armed or military force, but not economic force. Now, I, I said earlier that there is uh, an intersection or an overlap between international law and um, the international law on the use of force, mainly because if we examine Article 5 of the Rome Statute, which created uh, the International Criminal Court, under Article 5 of the Rome Statute, it provides that um, crimes of aggression are among the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole, and which therefore mean meant that uh, crimes of aggression uh, would mean that the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court uh, can be invoked. And in, in looking at uh, Article 5 of the Rome Statute, pertaining to uh, crime of aggression, particularly in relation to Article 9 of the Rome Statute, it would mean that the use of force against another state uh, could trigger uh, the, the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. So to the extent that there is a, a war, uh, a crime of aggression by one state against another state, then there would be the intersection of, um, of international criminal law and the use of force. However, we, we recall that under Article 2 of um, the United Nations Charter, what is prohibited is not just the use of force, but also the threat of the use of force. And the threat of the use of force, therefore, does not constitute a crime of aggression. It, the, the threat of use of force would be a violation of international law, both under customary international law and particularly under Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter, but the threat of use of force, or the threat of aggression, does not of its own uh, constitute a, a violation of um, the Rome Statute, which would then trigger the, the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, which was created as a result of the Rome Statute, or the Rome Statute creating the 
International uh, Criminal Court. So, uh, under Article 8 of the Rome Statute, it defines the crime of aggression as the planning, preparation, initiation, or execution by a person in a position effectively to exercise control over or to direct the political or military action of a state of an act of aggression, which by its character, gravity, and scale constitutes a manifest violation of the Charter of the United Nations. And article, in Article 8, the act of aggression is also defined, uh, defined as the use of armed force. So, if the Rome Statute is to be invoked, what the act of aggression must involve the use of armed force. So if what is involved is merely the threat of the use of armed force, that will not constitute a crime of aggression under the Rome Statute. What we should also know when we examine uh, the topic in week nine on, on international criminal law is that the, the, the international, uh, that is that international criminal law, uh, although it is now mainly based on its, uh, the codification of laws of international law pertaining to international war crimes. The Rome Statute, however, is conventional law. It is based on the consent of states, uh, which means, therefore, that the only states that will be bound under the Rome Statute will be those states which are parties to the Rome Statute. And we should be aware that the United States, Russia, uh, China, and Myanmar, among others, are not parties to the Rome Statute, and therefore they are not bound by the Rome Statute, and the International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction uh, over these states, even if they were to commit uh, violations of international criminal law as defined under the Rome Statute. Now, this is not to say that um, the world community has no recourse against states that commit international war crimes, because we know that the United Nations Security Council has the power to, uh, to create international criminal tribunals, as it has done in Sierra, Sierra Leone, for example, or in Rwanda or um, the Bosnian Wars. Uh, but the, the, only pro the, the main problem there is that for the UN Security Council to create international criminal tribunals for the purpose of prosecuting uh, international war crimes that are committed by states, it will have to mean that uh, that none of the, the, the states which are permanent, permanent members of the United Nations Security Council will invoke the right to veto. And we know that China, Russia, and the United States, as well as uh, the UK, for example, have veto powers in the UN Security Council. So if one of these states vetoes a UN Security Council resolution, then uh, the UN Security Council is not in a position, for example, to create international criminal tribunals. Now, let's examine again uh, the, in, in, in greater detail the, the law against the use and third force. And to an extent, we are surprised because if the United Nations already prohibited the use of force and the third use of force under Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter, why is it that there seem today to, to, to be wars of aggression and the use of armed force uh, by one state against another state? And the perfect example of this would be the invasion by Russia of uh, the Crimean Peninsula, which is really part of the territory of Ukraine. How is it that uh, Russia is able to do that? And this happened in 2018. And um, in that particular court, in, the, in that particular case, therefore, what is the, the recourse of, of, the, of, of the world community? What exactly can uh, Ukraine do? So that, that's a perplexing uh, question even now. Uh, we also know that the armed force is used in places such as Syria and in places such as Iraq. Uh, and armed force is also used continuously by, or, or continually by Israel uh, against Lebanon and against uh, Palestine, which is hoping to be a state. So even, even now, uh, the use of armed force persists, which can be very, very, very troubling. And so we need to think, when we talk about uh, the prohibition under international law of the use of force and the threat of the use of force, uh, 
we not only should be thinking in terms of whether or not the actions of one state constitute violations of international law prohibiting the use or threat of force, but also the issue of enforcement. So assuming that you have a state that is in fact in breach of uh, laws of international law that prohibit the use and the threat of force, what exactly can the world community do? So look at what's happening in Syria. Look at what's happening in, in, in Ukraine. And we realize that to a great extent, if the major powers or the superpowers, which can be China uh, or Russia or the United States are involved, then the United Nations Security Council is really in that, to a great extent, powerless. Uh, the United Nations also doesn't have uh, real powers because uh, the United Nations General Assembly uh, is mainly for diplomacy and it doesn't have any, it doesn't wield powers of its own. It, under the United Nations Charter, there is the international uh, criminal justice. But again, the international criminal justice as uh, the judicial organ of the United Nations is limited because the enforcement of any of its decisions and orders are really reliant upon the willingness of states who become uh, respondents to, the, to, to a case before the uh, International Court of Justice to comply with the decision. So if a state decides not to obey uh, a decision of the International uh, Court of Justice, the ICHJ has no power or mandate to enforce its own decisions. And uh, to a great extent, the enforcement of that decision will have to rely on perhaps the, uh, the outcry, if, if it would exist, from the other members of the world community. But it also means that if you are a superpower, such as the United States, Russia, or China, you're likely to be in a position to ignore uh, much of what the world community says. But that is the state of um, the law of the use of force. Uh, it's one thing to talk about the violation of international law. It's altogether a, a different matter to talk about how to enforce, uh, you know, uh, the respect for the prohibition against the use of force, even if uh, there would have been decisions made by the ICJ. So uh, earlier we talked already about uh, the law of the use of force versus uh, or in relation to international criminal law. And we already said that under Article 5 of the Rome Statute and in relation to Article 8 of the Rome Statute, uh, the crime of aggression uh, is, a, is one that would trigger the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, but at the same time, a crime of aggression would constitute a violation of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter. The other issue, therefore, that we need to examine is the threat of force, which also is prohibited by the United Nations Charter under Article 2, Paragraph 4. And uh, just recently, uh, this was I think about 2016, the Pakistani uh, minister issued uh, a nuclear warning to Israel after it was being tricked by a fake news site. Because what we need to remember as well is that Pakistan uh, has uh, nuclear weapons of its own in the same manner that India does and Israel is also likely to be in possession of nuclear weapons. And so when Pakistan uh, threatened uh, Israel that it was going to uh, nucle use nuclear weapons, uh, we, we would see that uh, that would be a violation of international law. This had happened because it had thought, Pakistan had thought that Israel threatened to use, you know, to, to invade or to attack uh, Pakistan for harboring uh, terrorists uh, that were detrimental to the security and peace of, of Israel. But in fact, it was fake news, which is quite common nowadays. We also know that North Korea threatened a nuclear strike uh, against uh, South Korea and against the U.S. amid the South Korea drill uh, in 2016. That again, that threat of force, especially the, the threat of a nuclear strike, is a violation of international law. But again, the other question is, you know, the question of enforcement. Uh, can the world community really, uh, uh, can the world community really uh, implement the prohibition of the threat of force, against the threat of force? Uh, 
Now, why else do we know that the use of force is prohibited under international law? There are, in fact, instances when a state may use force, and a state may use force as an act of self-defense. So under the United Nations Charter, particularly under 50, Article 51, uh, a state may use force as part of self-defense. And force may also be used as part of collective self-defense uh, when the United Nations Security Council uh, uses uh, force uh, for the purpose of collective self-defense. There is a, a fair exception to the, the use of force under the United Nations Charter, uh, under Article 107. One of that, that particular exception said that force may also be used against former enemy states, and this in particular had reference to <clears throat> the Axis powers during World War II, uh, which were Germany and, and Italy, uh, as well as uh, against uh, Japan. But of course, after, the, after World War II and after the the um, creation of the international military tribunals uh, of the Far East, which tried during the you know, Tokyo War Trials, which tried uh, Japanese uh, military officials and Japanese civilian officers who were involved with war crimes, as well as the Nuremberg Trials, which uh, sought to punish uh, Nazi uh, military officers for the crimes of genocide. The Article 107 is now a, a spent or a dead a, a, a dead law, because there are no longer there is no longer uh, the idea of former enemy states of the United Nations. So therefore, today uh, there are two exceptions to the use of force. So you, force may be used, or armed force may be used by one state in self-defense, and it can also be used by uh, the United Nations Security Council as part of collective self-defense. And let's examine this further. So under Article Fifty One of the United Nations Charter, it provides that there is nothing in the present charter which impairs the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. So the emphasis should be that the right to self-defense can only be triggered if there is an armed attack. Okay, so take note of that. And as well, we need to remember that the right to self-defense has always been recognized as part of customary international law. So the right to self-defense as recognized by Article 51 is an inherent right of individual states. So the right to self-defense is not a right that was granted by the United Nations Charter. It is a right under inter customary international law of every state, the right to self-defense. So the right to self-defense was codified in the UN Charter, but the right of self-defense has always been recognized under customary international law. Now, let's examine a few other things. Uh, some, some of us may still remember the Cuban missile crisis. I wasn't born then, but... I, I enjoyed reading about the, the Cuban Missile Crisis during the time of uh, President Kennedy because uh, this, was during the, this was the time when the Union Soviet of Socialist Republic, which, you know, that, that, the umbrella state of which Russia, Ukraine, uh, and other states, uh, uh, Middle Eastern European states, used to be part of the USSR, uh, th that was the time when the Soviet Union uh, tried to uh, install atomic weapons in, in Cuba. And at that time, of course, uh, the, the technology about weapons wasn't such that the Soviet Union or even the United States was in a position to, uh, to, to strike at, uh, you know, for Russia, for the for Soviet Union to strike at uh, the United States directly or for the United States directly to strike at the Soviet Union because, you know, the, the, the powers of uh, the intercontinental ballistic missiles did not exist then. So that the only way, therefore, for a state mainly to, uh, to use atomic weapons against another state would be for, for one state 
to locate uh, these atomic weapons quite close to another state or to an enemy state. Uh, we recall, for example, that when the atomic bombs were dropped by uh, the United States in Japan, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it wasn't because of the, the guided missile weapons that are quite common today or the use of intercontinental ballistic missiles. It was because uh, the United States had to use uh, uh, fighter bombers to transport atomic bombs and drop them directly over a particular area. But today, uh, you know, nuclear weapons can be fired not, not only from, from the territory of one state, but it can also be fired, as we know, from, from nuclear submarines. So, the, the, you know, the, the world map has changed. But at that time, uh, one of the basic questions was, was the United States in a position to actually attack Cuba uh, if it had attempted to, to um, allow the installation of atomic weapons so close to the United States? Could the right to self-defense be triggered by, uh, you know, by those actions? And of course, uh, in that act of brinkmanship, eventually uh, what the United States did was to impose a blockade, which prevented uh, certain uh, sus ships suspected of carrying atomic weapon bombs or, or parts that could be used to develop the atomic bomb in, 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 in Cuba. The United States imposed a naval blockade, which at that time could potentially have led to a confrontation, an armed conflict between Russia and uh, the United States, because the basic question then was, uh, were those acts of um, imposing a naval blockade uh, in, in international waters, did that constitute a, a crime of aggression? Did that in, uh, constitute the use of armed force by the United States against, against the Soviet Union? And of course, we now know that, you know, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was the Soviet Union which blinked. And they ended up, you know, uh, the, the, uh, these uh, ships which were suspected of, of containing uh, parts or of atomic bombs or atomic bombs themselves, uh, they went back to the Soviet Union. We also know that, uh, well, not really we know, but for some of us, uh, and this was the year I was born, there was also the, the I, I consider one of the great stories of, uh, of wars, the Six Day War, which was a war fought by Israel against Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. So if you examine if you examine you know, the world map, you see Israel being such a small state. But in 1967, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria combined forces, these were Arab states, in order to in invade uh, the Golan Heights, in order to invade Israel. And given the superiority, well, I won't use the word superiority. Good, well, probably correct. Given the numerical superiority of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria in terms of the number of tanks that they had, the number of um, the number of uh, the number of fighter planes they had, the number of soldiers they had, you know, it would have been easy to conceive that this was a war that Israel would easily lose. So when the you know, and when the when the these Arab states of Egypt, Jordan, is and Syria attacked Israel. This was also during the, the Yom Kippur, which is a, a very sacred uh, day in, in, in Israel, where people essentially, uh, you know, try to just don't, not, not do anything, but engage themselves in prayer. So it was that time that uh, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria began to invade Israel and attack uh, some of its um, military installations. And surprisingly, during that six-day war, who do you think won? It was actually uh, Israel that won. Uh, Israel was able to destroy much of uh, the armies of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. And what Israel did was to actually uh, even penetrate part of um, Jordan and Egyptian territory. Uh, and today, Israel happens to, to control uh, territory that used to belong to Egypt and Jordan as part of the six-day war. But uh, so because there was an armed conflict then, there was obviously the use of force at that time. It was quite clear that there was a breach of the prohibition against the use of force. Now, on the part of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, they were arguing that, you know, it was a potentially a preemptive strike. 
against uh, Israel or that Israel had already been responsible for acts of armed aggression against their states. But uh, we will notice in that particular instance that uh, the United Nations General Assembly and even the United Nations Security Council had difficulty uh, trying uh, on its own to, uh, you know, to control the, the war that broke out between these four states. And it, it, it was left to, to these states to have that skirmish and try to settle scores on their own. But it does tell us that, you know, uh, armed acts of uh, armed aggression can t continue today. And we saw this happening as well uh, during the uh, Vietnam War in the 1960s, as well as the Korean War. And we're, happening, we're, seeing, we're seeing it happen today in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, when the United States invaded Iraq. We also saw it happening uh, in the invasion by Iraq of Kuwait in the 1990s. So the basic question we need to ask is, is there a distinction between an armed attack versus the use of force? So the basic question is, let's assume that a state provides weapons, logistics, and other armed support, or other support to a local armed group that is seeking to topple the government of state B. So the first question we need to ask is, does state A violate the rule against the use of force? And the, the more important question as well, can state B use armed force against state A in self-defense? Because remember, uh, it is permissible for one state to use armed force as part of self-defense. So if state A is providing weapons, logistics, and other support to a local armed group that is seeking to topple the government of state B, can state B use armed force against state A? Think about that. And the answer is, uh, the answer uh, really is about trying to make a distinction between an armed attack and the use of force. So not every use of force will constitute an armed attack as we see in the case of, in the, in the, in the Nicaragua case. But first, let's go back to what the United Nations Charter says. So the United Nations Charter makes a distinction, as we know, between an armed attack, which would allow uh, a state to use force as part of self-defense, as opposed to a violation of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the, United, of the United Nations Charter, which prohibits the threat or use of force. So the threat or, or use of force, as we already know, is not similar to an armed attack. They, you know, when a state uses force, potentially, uh, it can be armed force. And therefore, that will, uh, that will uh, constitute uh, a violation of Article 2, Paragraph 4. But the use of force of its own will not necessarily mean that there is an armed attack, as we examine the case of the Nicaragua case. So when you look at the case of the Nicaragua versus United States of America in 1986, concerning the military and paramilitary activities in the Nicaragua, we recall that at this time, the United States, uh, the United States uh, was trying to uh, sponsor and support the Contras uh, who were trying to topple the Sandinista government, the legitimate Sandinista government of Nicaragua at that time. So the United States was supplying weapons, supplying uh, military advisors, logistics, and other ways to um, you know, provide support to the Contras. And Nicaragua, therefore, filed a, a case in the United States, uh, in the International Court of Justice against the United States to complain about you know, violations of, of international law. And the court in that particular case ruled that um, for an armed attack to have occurred against another state, it is not necessary for a foreign state to use its own military. So if uh, the United States, for example, were to use, uh, you know, uh, armed bands, groups, irregulars, or mercenaries to carry out acts of armed force against another state, such as Nicaragua, that would then be a the only a violation of international law, but that would also constitute an armed attack. Okay, But the ICJ in this particular case also stated that assistance, the mere assistance to rebels, in the form of the provision of weapons or logistical 
or other support did not constitute an armed attack. So going back to the question B that we posed earlier, if a state merely provides, well, maybe merely is too, is too weak, but if a state provides weapons or logistical or other support to rebels uh, all, uh, that are operating within another state, that by itself will not constitute an armed attack, which would then trigger the, the right of self-defense of another state to use armed force. Um, so that, so the assistance alone, uh, the provision of weapons or logistical or other support alone will not constitute an armed attack as a trigger, uh, the right to self-defense. But it has to be uh, sending uh, of armed bands or groups, irregulars or mercenaries to carry out acts of armed force, which would mean that uh, there is an armed attack which would then trigger the right of self-defense. So there is a distinction there. So uh, in the context of the Nicaragua versus United States of America case in the ICG in 1976, if the United States provides assistance to Syrian rebels, in the form of the provision of um, weapons or logistical or other support, would it mean that the United States has engaged in an armed attack against Syria? Or for that matter, if Russia provides assistance to Ukrainian rebels or separatists in the form of the provision of weapons or logistical support or other support, would it mean that Russia is uh, involved in an armed attack against Ukraine, which would then allow Ukraine to uh, to use armed force against Russia if Ukraine were able to do so? The answer in both cases would be no. But if Russia uh, uses uh, armed force in the, in the form of, uh, in the for definition of the Nicaragua case, uses armed bands, groups, irregulars, or mercenaries uh, to carry out uh, acts of armed force against Ukraine, then in that particular case, uh, Ukraine would have the power to uh, resort to force against uh, Russia as part of self-defense. But of course, that's only, only in theory because there is no way that uh, Ukraine would be in a position to actually clash against, against Russia uh, in an armed conflict. We know that Ukraine simply, simply will lose. So Ukraine in that particular case has to rely on the world community to try to control the expansive, uh, the expansionary designs of Vladimir Putin. Now, the other question that we need to ask is in relation to, uh, in, uh, is the relationship between self-defense and terrorists. So the question we should ask is, is there a prohibition against states threatening or using force against terrorist organizations? And the answer is no, because under Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter, the, the, the prohibition is only in relation to the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. And obviously, if it's a terrorist organization, it is not a state. So a state is free to threaten terrorist organizations or is free to use force, armed force, against terrorist organizations. The only question will be, the only problem will be when uh, the use of uh, armed force by a state against a terrorist group or a terrorist organization would occur in the territory of another state because in that particular case, that will be in violation of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of another state. That will be in breach of international law. And uh, we know, uh, we know, therefore, but we know, therefore, following the case of Nicaragua versus United States of America, where it was state stated that an armed attack uh, to have occurred against another state, it is not necessary for a foreign state to use its own military. The situation, therefore, will be different if a terrorist organization is really being harbored by, uh, by another state, and that terrorist organization is used by another state in order to try to attack another foreign state. So, for example, uh, when you examine uh, the case of, of, of um, Israel, when Israel uh, tries to uh, invade or attack Lebanon or even Palestine, the idea is that these terrorist organizations are being harbored by Lebanon and by Palestine in order for these terrorist groups to attack Israel 
In that case, uh, Israel would invoke its right uh, to self-defense to use armed attack or armed force against uh, the terrorist organizations uh, operating in, uh, in, in, in uh, Lebanon or in Palestine, even if it means invading the territory of, of, of let's say, Lebanon. And it's also happening uh, in the case of, of, of Syria. So the other question that we need to talk about is the idea of anticipatory self-defense. So when we spoke of the self-defense, it was in the con context of an actual armed attack undertaken by one state against another. But is there uh, acceptance of the rule of anticipatory self-defense? Uh, in 1981, for example, Israel attacked Iraq, uh, Iraq's nuclear reactor on the ground, um, on the ground that it was acting in self-defense. So Iraq at that time had not, uh, had threatened had threatened but not used force against Israel, but uh, on the on the on the premise that Iraq could then use uh, its so-called nuclear reactor to attack Israel. Uh, Israel then uh, used the, its right to self-defense to attack uh, Iraq's nuclear reactor reactor uh, within Israeli territory. Uh, the question is: Did that constitute a violation of international law? particularly Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter. Think about that. And we're going to go back to that question in a, in a short while. There's also the question about, uh, today, Iran's desire to um, have nuclear weapons of its own. And it potentially, it probably does. It's still not clear. But uh, the United States uh, and Israel are very concerned about the development of nuclear weapons by Iran because... Uh, you know, Iran has considered the United States and Israel to be uh, two of the world's greatest evils. They're, they consider the U.S. and Israel. Iran considers U the US, United States and Israel to be uh, world satans. And uh, Iran has therefore made continuing threats to, to attack, um, to attack uh, the United States and Israel. Israel is different because given the fact that it is such a small state, if it were to experience a nuclear attack, such as say by, by, uh, by Iran, it would wipe out Israel from the face of the earth. It would decimate the population of, of, of Israel. And for that reason, Israel is, is quite aware of the, the dangers posed by Iran in the event that Iran succeeds in uh, having nuclear weapons of its own. And so therefore, even today, Israel continues to to, to state that as a matter of policy, it will be prepared to undertake a preemptive strike against, against um, in, uh, Iran if it feels that its uh, security has been threatened. We're also aware that um, a few years ago, the, the nuclear reactors of Iran were subjected to attacks by, I think they call it the worm virus or something, and which, which caused the nuclear reactors to go haywire. And that, you know, that destroyed uh, much of, um, of uh, the nuclear reactors. It destroyed uh, the capability of Iran to, to create nuclear weapons. We, we, there are two questions to be asked. Uh, one, did, assuming that you know, those actions could be traced to Israel, and it, of course it couldn't, did that constitute a, a violation of the law of use of force? And... Uh, if, if Iran could say that Israel was responsible for it, could Iran then say that it could uh, use armed force against Israel uh, as an act of self-defense? So those are questions which I'd like you to think about. We also know uh, the dangers about the idea of anticipatory self-defense, particularly in the context of the Cold War, Cold War in the 1980s, where there was the concept of the mutually assured destruction. Because the United States and the Soviet Union at the time had in their possession an arsenal of um, nuclear weapons, they were in a position to, uh, you know, uh, to destroy each other. And the, the idea then was that, you know, if, if Russia, uh, Soviet Union attacks the United States, the United States could strike back against the Soviet Union. Or the Soviet, if, the United, if the Soviet Union attacked the United States, you know, um, 
the United States could attack the Soviet Union and vice versa. So that was the idea of mad, mutual sure destruction. So the idea then was about you know, the idea of a preemptive strike, which even today uh, persists. So the, the, the fact that there are, there are nuclear submarines, uh, both uh, controlled by the United States and Russia, uh, and even China today, uh, this enables these states to undertake preemptive uh, strikes against uh, states that, that could threaten them. Uh, and of course, uh, if there, this were to happen, the question really is, would the you know, world community be in a position to actually do anything? And we recall that the problem really with the U.S. Security Council is that the U.S. Security Council would be powerless if uh, its permanent members exercise their veto powers. Uh, the permanent members include the United Nation, uh, the United States, Russia, and China, and even also the UK. If any of these states uh, exercise their their veto powers, the UN, UN Security Council is powerless. Now, uh, what we also need to remember is that there was an attempt to um, to to speak of anticipatory self-defense. In 2002, for example, the former United States President George W. Bush delivered a speech at West Point where he said that our security will require all Americans to be forward-looking and resolute, to be ready for preemptive action when necessary to defend our liberty and to defend our lives. So this was uh, an expression of the, uh, the, the military strategy of the United States that it was prepared to undertake preemptive action. It has been doing so. And the question that needs to be, to, 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 to be, to be asked then is whether or not uh, preemptive action or anticipatory self-defense is now a norm of customary international law. Because we know that uh, under the United Nations Charter, Article 51, and as part of customary international law, the right of self-defense, meaning the right of a state to use force as uh, as, as part of self-defense, can only happen if there is an armed attack. So there, under the United Nations Charter, under customary international law, you cannot invoke the right to self-defense on the basis of anticipatory self-defense or preemptive action. But at that time, the United States has, had already um, articulated it's, uh, it's understanding that its military strategy involves the use of preemptive action or preemptive self-defense. But under international law at the moment, uh, anticipatory self-defense is not accepted. So there is no right to anticipatory self-defense, both under customary international law, as well as the United Nations Charter. And, but of course, if you have a superpower such as the United States, or such as Russia invoking anticipatory self-defense, such as in the case of Russia invoking its right to protect itself against Ukraine or perhaps against Georgia, there is really little that the world community can do. So that's just the reality of things. Now, there is, however, a difference uh, in relation to the idea of anticipatory self-defense and terrorist organizations because uh, the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 1370, 1373 on 28 September 2001, in which it said that the Security Council reaffirming also its unequivocal condemnations of the terrorist attacks which took place in New York, Washington, D.C., and Pennsylvania on 11 September 2001. It expresses its determination to prevent all such attacks. So the United Nations Security Council recognizes now that it is possible for a state to undertake preventive measures or what can be considered to be anticipatory self-defense involving the use of force against terrorist organizations. The only problem really there is that when you speak of a terrorist organization, typically these terrorist organizations are going to be uh, in, uh, you know, are, are, are not states of their own or states of themselves and therefore are typically hiding or being harbored by, by another state. So, for example, we recall that um, after the after 911, uh, which was really headed by Osama bin Laden, the United States uh, did did all it, it could to try to locate Osama bin Laden, and Osama bin Laden eventually uh, was identified to have been harbored within Pakistan, which is meant to be a state friendly to the United States, 
And so what the United States did then was to actually, uh, you know, attack Osama bin Laden in his compound in Pakistan. That, if you notice, uh, is actually a violation of uh, international law because the United States invaded Pakistan in that, to, to that extent uh, by uh, breaching the territorial integrity and territorial so sovereignty of, of Pakistan. But then again, you know, uh, in that case, what could Pakistan really do, right? Or what could the UN Security Council do? Nothing. So that's the reality of it all. And so uh, after studying this topic, you should then be able to discuss and explain the rules of international law and the use of force and the relationship of the law of, law of use of force with international criminal law. And so thank you for listening to this lecture podcast on international uh, on the law of use of force, this is Dr. Manjo Eisen. Bye.